Today we begin a, a new series called I Promise. Um, and so we're going to be looking at uh, these promises that God has made to us. And we might be wondering, some of us, do promises even mean anything anymore? Uh, if you don't mind, I'd love for you to just think about for a moment uh, the last time somebody made you a promise and they broke that promise. Maybe for some of us that's been fairly recently. Maybe it's been a while, but uh, you can remember this time somebody made me this promise and didn't come through. Uh, when was the last time you made a promise and you broke the promise? I bet there's a good chance that every one of us have been on that side of the experience as well. And the reason is because the difficulty with promises is promises presume on the future, right? When we make a promise to somebody, we're presuming our ability to actually come through and fulfill that promise. Most of the time when we make a promise, our intention is to come through and to fulfill it. But there is a presumption on the future with regards to that. You know, I can promise to pick up my kids from school on time, right? But that presumes that with my best intention of making it to the school on time, even if I do certain things like give myself enough space and time, a little bit of margin, right? I need to be there at such and such a time, but I leave five minutes early, seven minutes early, ten minutes early. The reality is I'm still presuming the future, right? Who knows if there isn't something that's going to happen that's going to actually hold me back for 12 minutes or 15 minutes, but beyond that time that I promised that I would be there. Uh, many of us have signed lease agreements, mortgages, uh, for a home that we want to either live in or to buy. And when we do that, we do it with the intention of actually coming through and fulfilling the lease or paying off the mortgage, right? Uh, and so when we make promises, we're presuming on the future. And, and so one of the things that we have to understand when it comes to promises is that there's only one being in the entire universe who can actually keep his every promise. You might have guessed that that being is God. God is the only one that can make and fulfill every promise that he has made, right? We tend to make promises under the best conditions. Uh, those of you that uh, have been married or are married, chances are you uh, stood there opposite uh, this person that you fell in love with, right? And you made promises, a covenant, right? To love, honor, and cherish until what? Until death do us part. And you did that. You did that under the best of circumstances, right? I mean, you were in love. You were ready to tackle every single thing that life was going to bring your way together, right? You were doing, you were making this promise under the best of conditions. When we sign that mortgage agreement, right, we do it under the best of conditions, right? Uh, I have a job. I have uh, an expectation that the income uh, that I have is going to continue without interruption. And so it's not going to be a problem for me to make that mortgage payment month after month after month. But again, we're making promises under the best conditions, presuming on the future. And the reality is only God can actually keep his promises. And where we tend to make promises under the best conditions, God actually makes promises under the most unlikely of circumstances. What we're going to find this morning and over the next few weeks is that God makes promises to his people within the very context of hopelessness, within the very context of impossibility, right? It is when people find themselves at their wit's end that God there comes in with a promise that he is not only able, but willing to fulfill. In the book of Exodus, we read the story uh, and we find the promises that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. But I'd like to this morning just take a little time to introduce the idea of promise uh, so that we might understand a little bit uh, what's going on here. The context in which God makes these promises to his people, the nation of Israel, that we can also see as promises we can claim and take for ourselves as well. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the story of the nation of Israel, but if you're not, let me just kind of catch you up to where we are and what we're going to read here this morning. Uh, the nation of Israel actually started with a person. His name is Abraham, right? And Abraham was just this guy uh, whom God had selected to do something really, really special. 
over the course of many, many years. In fact, many, many generations. God spoke to Abraham and he said, Abraham, I want you to get up and leave your father's house, leave your homeland. I want you to take your wife and I'm going to bring you to a place that you do not know. And God made Abraham a promise. He said, I am going to multiply your descendants so that they are going to number like the stars of the sky or the sands of the seashore. And so Abraham believed God and he got up and he left. And then to make a long story short, Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons that we identify as the fathers, the ancestors of the 12 tribes of Israel. And circumstances were such that one of those sons was sold into slavery, ultimately landed in Egypt, and then in what only God could possibly order, became the second in command within the nation of Egypt. And the situation would be such that his family, his brothers and his father, whom he had been estranged from for many, many years, made their way down to Egypt to escape a famine. And there they became residents of the nation of Egypt. And so this person who had become a family was now kind of growing into something more of a people, would ultimately become a nation. And because of this tremendous growth that they were experiencing, and this what seemed to be just unrivaled success and prosperity, the, the nation of Egypt actually started to get a little nervous. Nervous that these visitors, these strangers, these foreigners were going to grow to the extent that they themselves would be able to take over the nation of Egypt from the Egyptians themselves. And so they devised a strategy to keep this people in check. They enslaved them. They made them slaves. They, they subjugated and oppressed them. And I want to just read kind of some selections from the first few chapters of the book of Exodus to help us to understand exactly what life was like for this people called Israel. In Exodus chapter 1 it says, The Egyptians assigned taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. But the more they oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. They worked the Israelites ruthlessly and made their lives bitter with difficult labor in brick and mortar and in all kinds of field work. They ruthlessly imposed all this work on them. So you kind of see the scenario that's going on here, right? There's people who have now been sub subjugated and enslaved. While Egypt is doing everything it can to oppress them and keep them in check, it actually turns out that the more they're oppressed, the more they seem to thrive. The women are having crazy numbers of children, and the population, while Egypt is trying to keep it in check, just continues to grow and flourish. And so Egypt takes another step in its subjugation of the nation of Israel. They devise a plan to practice infanticide, to kill every male child that is born to every family in the nation of Israel. If the child is a son, Pharaoh decrees to the midwives, to those who are helping deliver these babies into the world, if the child is a son, kill him. Exodus chapter 2, the Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor. They cried out, and their cry for help because of the difficult labor ascended to God. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the Israelites and God knew. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. And I've heard them crying out because of their oppressors. And I know about their suffering. So again, you kind of see what's going on here, right? This people is living in utter, utter hopelessness. Unable to come out from underneath the oppression and the enslavement that they've been forced into. And not only are they required to work from dawn till dusk every single day, right, bearing the heavy load of what it meant to be the workers of these, these, these buildings that were being erected, and workers within the fields, right, at the, at, at the crack of the whip and the demands of heavy, heavy taskmasters. But now even their families are being mistreated in that their male sons are being killed. 
And so God recognizes what's going on. He hears their cries. And as many of you know, as the story goes, he calls out and selects this man by the name of Moses. And he tells Moses that he is to go back into Egypt and he is to rescue, he is to deliver the nation of Israel out from under the bondage of their enslavement. And so Moses comes, and he comes armed with a supernatural sign that he is coming from God, right? And so he speaks with the elders of the nation of Israel, and he demonstrates for them that he has come in the power of this God that they had long forgotten. And here's what it says in Exodus chapter 4. The people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had paid attention to them, and that he had seen their misery, they knelt low and worshipped. Now this people who had been oppressed and subjugated all of a sudden had a reason to have this glimmer of hope. This possibility that maybe there'd be a solution for the misery that they were experiencing in this life. But as life often goes, things didn't exactly work themselves out in immediate fashion. No, when Moses and his brother Aaron went to Pharaoh and demanded that Pharaoh let the nation of Israel go out into the wilderness to worship God, Pharaoh, instead of allowing this request to take place, he demands that the workload be increased, that the enslavement be harsher, that the oppression be worse than it was before. That day, Pharaoh commanded the overseers of the people as well as their foremen don't continue to supply people with straw for making bricks as before. They must go and gather straw for themselves, but require the same quota of bricks from them as they were making before. Do not reduce it, for they are slackers. That is why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Impose heavier work on the men, and then they will be occupied with it and not pay attention to the deceptive words of Moses and Aaron. And so now the Israelites, whose lives were miserable and impossible but before, take another step in the direction of just utter misery. Before they were supplied with the straw that they used to make their quota of bricks, but now they're required to go and fetch the straw themselves while still producing the same amount that they were doing before. And so what task had been difficult was now impossible. And so... The foremen of the Israelites, they go before Pharaoh. They say, what's up? When they left Pharaoh, though, they confronted Moses and Aaron, who stood waiting to meet them. And here's what they said, right? This people, again, remember, that had been given a little glimmer of hope that there was a solution for their misery, who felt like they were taking a step forward in their freedom, now find themselves retreating two steps backward. And they said to Moses and Aaron, may the Lord take note of you and judge because you have made us reek to Pharaoh and his officials, putting a sword in their hand to kill us. Again, we're talking about how God makes promises under the most unlikely of circumstances. Right? It is within this context that God makes the promises that we're going to look at over the next few weeks. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Here's what God instructs Moses to tell the nation of Israel. Here are the four promises that God makes to his people. Therefore, tell the Israelites, God says, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from forced labor of the Egyptians and rescue you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. We're going to look at each of these four promises, one for each week over the next four weeks. But I'd like to introduce us to the idea of promise and what and how this promise is made within the context of what was going on within the nation and the experience of Israel. See, Israel, their slavery is actually a picture of our slavery and our lostness without God. Uh, Israel had, for many, many years, kind of been without God. Uh, perhaps there were stories that were still continuing to be passed down from parent to child and grandparent to grandchild. Stories of the promise that God had made to Moses, I mean to Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob. But years had gone by, hundreds of years had elapsed between that time. I mean, Abraham was a distant memory. He was practically folklore 
within the nation of Israel. They had no idea who this God was that had made these promises. They had forgotten his very name. They had no understanding or concept of who he was or what he was like. All they knew was that they came from an experience different from that of the Egyptians. And now here they are enslaved, and their slavery and their lostness without God is a picture of the same kind of slavery and lostness we experience when our lives find themselves without God. And the promises that God makes to this people that he is going to rescue out from the bondage of Egypt— and form among them a people for himself, these promises point to our need for rescue. The way in which God was going to transform the very lives of every single Israeli man and woman, boy and girl, it points to our need for transformation. You know, some of us, as we hear uh, the oppression and the bondage that Israel was experiencing, some of us might be able to easily draw from that an analogy to our present experience. I imagine there are some of us here in the room this morning where we would recognize that there is something or someone that has us under its control. Some of us would be perhaps even brave enough to willingly and openly admit that there is something that has me enslaved. There's something that has power over me. There's something that has mastery over my life. There are many stories. Uh, we could use the story of the alcoholic, for one, who comes to this point in his or her life where they're willing to admit that alcohol is a problem. It is a substance that has some mastery and some control over their lives. If you look at the 12-step program within Alcoholics Anonymous, this is step number one, right? It is admitting you have a problem. It's admitting, in essence, that alcohol has control over your life. It's the first step you have to take if you're ever going to find freedom from that thing that has you under its control. And for that person, the idea of escaping that control is probably really, really inspiring. But I'll bet at the very same time that it's inspiring, it's just as equally doubtful. You can imagine that person who has been under the control of some particular substance, some particular addiction, the control or the mastery of some particular thing that just kind of seems to have its claws deeply, deeply, deeply set into your life. Or perhaps it's the mastery of, or control of another person or a group of people over you, right? And, and the idea of, of, of experiencing freedom from that control, it's inspiring, but experience has taught you that freedom is also doubtful. I'll bet you the story of many who have walked down the steps of recovery from some particular addiction can look back at a day where they just thought, man, I will never, ever, ever be able to actually break free from this thing. Right? They look back and they're just, they themselves are left in awe at the reality that they've been able to come out from under the control of that thing because the control of that thing was so great. And listen, if that's you today, if you're here this morning and you recognize that there is something that has control of your life, I want to encourage you to beware the danger of despair. The thing that you need to be on guard, as we're talking about the promises of God, here's the thing that you have to especially be on the lookout for, and that is the danger of despair. What is despair? Despair is that, despair is that nagging feeling that'll never be different from how it is now. Despair is that feeling that while it might be wonderful to dream about, to think about that life could be different, that I could actually find freedom from control of this particular thing. Despair reminds you that it'll never happen. Despair leaves you kind of wallowing in the misery that coming free and coming out from the bondage of that thing that's controlling you could ever be possible. We have to beware the danger of despair because if we are lost in our despair, the promises of God are going to find great difficulty actually bringing us up, out from underneath that thing that has mastery and control over us. 
Listen, if there is something that is controlling you today, if there is something, that, and it could be a big thing, it could be a little thing, it could be that thing that man, you just wish you could find victory over once and for all, you're sick and tired of it, but yet you just can't seem to kind of get over it. Listen, God doesn't want for you to be under bondage to that thing anymore. Certainly not for the rest of your life. And there are promises that God has made to you. And there is help that God wants to give you to come out from underneath that thing. But you have to, cost, you have to be cautious not to just give in to despair. Because despair, despair will it'll ask you to just quit. It'll say, don't bother. Right? You've done it before. I mean, I imagine that for many uh, using the example of the alcoholic who has gone through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous or some other kind of recovery program. Like, I bet for many of them, it doesn't all work out the first time. I'll bet there's an effort to kind of make their way through the system, right? But then as they're making progress, all of a sudden there's a relapse. They find themselves back in that same state that they were before. And maybe they've tried again and again and again and again. And listen, I mean, what is today? January, whatever. How many of you made some New Year's resolutions? How many of you have made some New Year's resolutions that are just repeat episodes of resolutions you've made before? Right? Why do we do that? Because we know, we know I want to do better. I want to be better. And no matter how hard it seems like I tried, I just, I kind of find myself Falling back to the way I've always been. Listen, that's despair. And that is the last place God wants for you to live in. Is in this place of despair as if it could never be better than it already has. I don't care if you've tried two times, five times, ten times, a hundred times to get victory over whatever that thing is. I want to urge you to anchor your feet and hear the promises of God and move forward. Beware the danger of despair. The Israelites were very subject to experiencing this thing called despair. The story goes, as Moses led them up out of Egypt following the judgments that God had passed on the nation of Egypt, all of a sudden they find themselves confronted by a sea in front of them and an army that is pursuing behind them. And here's what they say to Moses. What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. That's despair. God parts the sea. They walk through on dry ground. The army is swallowed up as the sea engulfs them. And then the story goes on to say they journeyed for three days in the wilderness without finding water. Now here they are dying of thirst. And they go again to Moses, they grumble to him, what are we going to drink? Later on, as they're continuing to wander in the wilderness, they find themselves without food to eat. And their hunger has them grumbling to Moses once again. Here's what they said to Moses, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Instead, you brought us out into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Do you hear what's going on here? Just days removed from that severe oppression that had them crying out, groaning to a God that they didn't even know. And having witnessed the mighty acts and the mighty judgments of God, the supernatural wonders that God was doing within their midst, they had already forgotten because their stomachs were hungry and their mouths were thirsty. And now they were pining for the days when they were back in Egypt, they, instead of describing those days as being days where they were tortured and enslaved and their children were being thrown into the river to die, they only look back and they think about the pots of meat and the bread that they ate. They'd forgotten how bad their slavery was. That's, that's despair. One of the things we have to understand as we kind of venture into this realm of God's promises is that God's promises aren't always immediate. In fact, God's promises are rarely immediate. The work that God wants to do in your life and in mine, like that is not going to come to its conclusion by the end of this service. 
we are not all going to listen to this and digest it to some degree and sing a few songs and walk out of here radically and completely and forever changed. The work that God wants to do in our lives, it is a slow work. I, I, the experience for some of us is there are leaps that we take in the way in which we are transformed. Uh, sometimes it's almost like walking through a portal <laughs> from one place to the next when it comes to what God does in our lives. But for the most part, the work that God is doing in our lives, it is a daily work. It is a grinding work. It is a work that God does slowly, almost immeasurably. It's hard for us to discern the difference between today and yesterday. But if we're able, if we let the work of God do its work in our lives, if we're able to kind of turn back the clock a year, two years, three years, it is then we can start to see how the work of God has worked in our lives. But God's promises aren't immediate. The rescue of the nation of Israel didn't just happen and it was over. God's promises also aren't just for your information. A lot of times, and the tendency that we might have as we look at these promises over the next few weeks is to consider these promises as information. You know, God makes this promise, and so there's a, a, there's a piece of knowledge that I have acquired that somewhere God made this promise to the nation of Israel that somehow applies to my life. But God's promises aren't just for your information. The reason why God establishes these promises, why he utters these promises into our lives, is to give us the opportunity to lean on those promises, to bank on them, to, to, to really invest ourselves in what it means to depend on who God is and the promises that he has made in our lives. That's what faith really is. Faith isn't getting everything that you want the moment that you want it. That's not faith. Faith is believing in what you can't see. Faith is holding on to that thing that you're hoping for. Faith is looking into the realm of what is impossible and seeing how with God it is possible. We hold on to the promises of God. And we lean on them as if they are sure, as if they are true, as if they are something that we can really, really count on. I want to talk to some of us, some of us others in the room, right? There are those of us that maybe are able to easily identify areas in our lives under which we're experiencing oppression and bondage and enslavement, right? Things that are captivating us, that have us enslaved. If we're honest, they have control over us. But listen, there's, a, there's some of us here today who, you know, as we listen to the difficulties that Israel is experiencing, we have a difficult time ourselves actually identifying with that. Right? We would hear that and we would say, you know, there's nothing controlling me. Some of us here in the room, we'd say, in our understanding of our experience today, there's nothing that I'm enslaved to. Right? I, I'm my own master, right? I mean, I'm not, uh, there's no... There's no pill that I feel like I have to take in order to kind of get through the day. There's no substance that I need. There's no, uh, right, there are a number of things that w our minds immediately go to that we think about as kind of controlling our lives. And we think, well, that's not me. I don't have any problems with any of that. This idea that nothing's wrong. Listen, if one of you were to come up here and hand me a life jacket, Say, this is for your safety, this is for your protection. It's like, okay, well, that life jacket's not going to mean anything to me, right? I'm not in, I'm not even near a body of water. I don't have any plans of being near or in a body of water anytime soon. That life jacket has no relevance for my life. And sometimes we think of God's promises in the same way. This idea that they're just, they're these promises that I don't really need. Let me ask you this question. Why, and this, this applies to some of us here. Like, I, I, hope, I hope we can all be open and honest enough with ourselves. Not, you don't have to be open and honest with me, but I would love for you to just kind of stretch yourself a little bit and be open and honest with yourself as we consider this question. Why is it, why is it that most people don't turn to God? 
Why is it that most people don't really, really surrender themselves fully and completely to God? Is it because they're is it because people think that they're so wicked, they're so evil, they're so depraved that God wouldn't have anything to do with them? Is it, you know, do people not come to church because they honestly think, right, because people say this all the time, right? Oh, man, if I walked into the doors of your church, the roof would fall in, right? Like people say that about themselves. Do they really believe that? No, they don't believe that. The reason why people don't come to God isn't because they think they're so far from God that God would never have them. The number one reason why people don't come to God is because they don't think they need him. That's why. And that's some of us here today. Like the reason why uh, when we talk through these promises, some of us are going to actually struggle to see how this really kind of fits into my life. Because I'm in a place right now where I don't need God. The, The promise sounds wonderful, but that's really all it is. It's not something that I have to depend on. It's not something that I have to pour every essence of my dependence into. Because the reality is I don't, I don't feel like I need to be rescued from anything. I don't really feel like I need to be delivered from anything. I don't really feel like I need anybody to tell me how my life could be any better than it already is. Because my life is just fine as it is. Thank you very much. Jesus said to this rich man who had asked him, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. And the story goes, the man went away from Jesus, sad, because he had a bunch of money and a lot of possessions. And Jesus said, you know, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And a lot of times people think that What Jesus is teaching about is primarily money, the problem of money, the problem of wealth and riches. That's not the problem. The problem isn't the money that the man had. The problem was the distraction that that money created in the life of that man. And so for those of us maybe that don't feel particularly like we're under the bondage or oppression of any particular thing or any particular person, here's the danger we need to be aware of. We need to beware of the danger of distraction. You know, some of us are distracted from really, truly understanding the depth of need that we have for God. The depth of need that we have for a Savior. The depth of need that we have for somebody to come alongside us and pick us up where we are and bring us where we need to be because we feel like Though we may not say it out loud, we feel like we're getting to where we need to go just fine on our own. The reason why we feel that way is because we've been distracted. Listen, we can be distracted by any number of things, right? Some of us are distracted by money. We have enough money that it provides us the margin that we need to kind of do whatever it is that we want to do in life. That's a distraction. Some of us are distracted by an addiction to social media. We just can't seem to get ourselves disconnected from that, you know, second life kind of cyber world thing that we have going on. It's distracted us enough from understanding the reality of our need in our real lives. Some of us are just binge watching our Netflix queue, right? Play another show, play another program. Some of us are running kids around to millions of activities or staying so busy ourselves that there's no room, there's no time for us to do honest, introspective contemplation about our lives, about where we're coming from, about where we're going. There's no quietness. There's no opportunity for the voice of God to speak to us. We almost walk around as if, hey, you know, if God's got something to say to, uh, say to me, he's got the whole sky he can write it up in. If God has anything to say to me, there's any number of ways That he could break into and interfere in the daily walk of my life and get my attention if he wants to. What we don't understand is that the way in which God speaks to us most of the time is this still small voice. But most of us have spent any number of ways distracting ourselves from what God 
wants to speak into our lives. We've distracted ourselves from what our hearts are truly aching for. My heart is yearning for something. My heart is aching for something. And you know what? I can can medicate that need. And I do. And I'll bet you do. With any number of ways that we distract ourselves. So beware the danger of distraction. Listen, God's promises aren't going to mean anything to you if you don't need them. I mean, I want you to come back next week. I really, really do. But the reality is, it's no, it's, there's really no point in you coming back to hear about how this promise is made to you and what the implications of that promise are for your life if you don't feel any need for that promise to be fulfilled in your life. God's promises won't mean anything if I don't need them. You know, the person who's in love with his money or her money, needs God's promise just as much as the person who finds themselves experiencing homelessness. Right, that person who has managed to amuse themselves with the ways in which we can be entertained by this world, has distracted themselves by any number of things that medicate us, from what it is that our hearts truly want and desire. They need God's promise just as much as the person who, like Jesus describes, is poor in spirit, who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, who finds themselves living in this world with nothing to show for. We need to come to this place where God's promises come to mean something to us. So let me just share with you kind of in everyday terms, how I understand these promises for our lives. This is what we're going to be talking about for the next four weeks. Number one, God will bring you out of bondage. The first promise God made to the Israelites is, I will bring you out of bondage. Now again, for some of us, this might feel like a really, really important thing that we need to experience in our lives because we know we're in bondage to something or some things or someone And God says, I will bring you out of bondage. But the reality is whether we feel that or understand or discern that or not, chances are every one of us, every one of us has fallen slave to the master of something, whether we've been able to discern it or not. And we need to experience what it means to be liberated from that bondage. Number two, God said, I will vanquish whatever it is that's holding you back. Whatever it is that's keeping you from ultimately becoming everything that God wants you to become, God says, I will come in with force and with power. And I will give you the strength and the grace that you need to vanquish that thing that's holding you back. If we were really honest, I'll bet every one of us could admit that there is something, there are things in our lives that are just getting in the way of us becoming what we were designed And who we were designed to become. The third promise is God will show you what you were created for. God's going to show you the very thing that you were created for. With that, there's going to come this just great sense of purpose, this understanding that, like, I was created for something that's going to feed into the fourth promise, which is God will make you part of something that's making a difference. You struggle with the idea that you're just kind of spinning your wheels, grinding your way through this life, aimless to some degree, maybe with no direction, no understanding of like, what's the end game here? I want you to know that God has made us a promise, every single one of us, that he will make us part of something that's making a difference. Those are four beautiful promises. Those are four life-changing promises. If we'll take them to heart, if we'll understand our need for them, if we'll engage them, And all that I believe God wants for them to mean in our lives. So I hope you'll come back next week.